In this video, we're going to talk about the cross ratio for the extended complex numbers. We're going to start off with something that we know from college algebra and, and some calculus classes. So the first thing, two distinct points in R2 determine a unique linear function, where I'm viewing this function as only having one real input. But uh, anyway, the function's formula is f of x is mx plus b. So in other words, two distinct points determine a line. Similarly, three distinct points in space determine a plane. And what we want to do is we want to try to answer a question like this in complex about Mobius transformations. So how many extended complex numbers does it take to determine a unique Mobius transformation? Recall the extended complex numbers. We denoted that by C hat. I did that in a previous video. And what we do is we take the ordinary complex numbers like a plus bi, and we're going to throw in the symbol infinity. And the way that the complex numbers interact with infinity just follow kind of limit ideas. So like now a complex number divided by zero, we're going to say that equals infinity instead of it being, you know, undefined or whatever. All right, so a more precise way to ask this question that we will try to answer in this video is, can we find the natural number n such that if you had a Mobius transformation from the extended complex plane to itself, knowing the value of that Mobius transformation at a handful of points, z1 through zn, allows us to theoretically figure out what does the Mobius transformation do to every point. Secondly, if you are given a list of distinct complex numbers or extended complex numbers, z1 through zn, and another list of distinct extended complex numbers, w1 through wn, so here I'm saying the z's are distinct from each other and the w's are distinct from each other, but it's okay if the z's and the w's have some overlap. Anyway though, given those two lists of extended complex numbers, there is only one Mobius transformation such that f takes z1 to w1, f takes z2 to w2, etc., all the way through f takes zn to wn. So we're gonna to try to answer this question. How many points does it take to determine a unique Mobius transformation? So the way we're going to do that is by using the following tool. The tool we're going to use is what this video is named after. Let's let z, z1, z2, and z3 be extended complex numbers. So all I mean there is like, hey, maybe somebody's infinity in that list, not just like an a plus bi. But what we're also going to require here is that z1, z2, z3 are distinct extended complex numbers. So no overlap between the z1, z2, z3 guys. The cross ratio of these four numbers, and again, numbers in quotations because maybe somebody's infinity because we're in the extended complex numbers. Anyway, the cross ratio of these four, it's the fraction z minus z1 times z2 minus 3 divided by z minus z3 times z2 minus z1. If you've encountered cross ratios in like geometry or like projective geometry, like this is in that same, in that same vein. Wikipedia has a really extensive page about the cross ratio and how it's been used, you know, since Euclid. It's a good read. So some notes that I want to make about this cross ratio. One, what if z equaled z3? So well, in the bottom then you get a zero. But remember in the extended complex plane, that's okay because everybody else here is non-zero. And so dividing a complex number by zero just gives me infinity in the extended complex plane. Also, without loss of generality, maybe somebody's infinity. Let's say z is infinity. Well, then we get infinity over infinity. Because remember, like infinity minus a complex number is still infinity. But what should happen is we're going to treat this kind of like an asymptote, where when I, when I think about this, I should just get you know, kind of the coefficient that was in front. In, in this case, it just reduces to z2 minus z3 over z2 minus z1. So in other words, the infinities cancel, whatever you want to say. So the last thing that we're going to denote, or we're going to make a note about the cross ratio is, <laughs> the notation for it we're going to use is with these square brackets, z, z1, z2, and z3. So let's just do a little example and make sure that like, okay, the cross ratio is not some scary thing. Let's pick some concrete complex numbers and plug them in and compute a cross ratio. Let's say z is 1, z1 is i, z2 is 0, z3 is minus i. Then the cross ratio of these guys, I'm going to plug those numbers into this formula here, this fraction. When I do that, uh, I think it looks like this. And I do a little bit of algebra. And I'm going to try to write this in the form a plus bi. So that's why in yellow, I'm multiplying the top and the bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. And uh, when you do that, I think it works out to 1 minus 2i minus 1 uh, over 2. And you have a big minus sign out front still. And uh, if I did this right, I think you should get i. And if I did that algebra wrong, then you, know, you just drag me in the comments or whatever. So what do I really care about in this video? 
I want to have a different perspective on the cross ratio. I'm going to view it as a function. So what we're going to do ahead of time is fix the pink points Z1, Z2, and Z3. So let's say we picked out these extended complex numbers ahead of time. And now we're going to treat Z as the variable. And so with that, I'm suggesting that we define a function f such that f of z is the cross ratio of z with those other three, again, predetermined extended complex numbers. Now, we're going to rewrite this a little bit. I'm going to distribute the z2 minus z3 in the top, not FOIL, just distribute it to z and z1. And similarly, I'm going to distribute the z2 minus z1 in the bottom to z and z3. Again, not FOIL, just distribute. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I notice that, hey, that's something z plus b over something z plus d. And what am I trying to get at? When I view the cross ratio from this perspective as a function, it's a Mobius transformation. And just to uh, really believe me that it's a Mobius transformation, you should go check that ad minus bc is not zero. Remember, that was the requirement to be a Mobius transformation. Otherwise, you just say it's a linear fractional transformation. Anyway. So what does that tell us? So when I think about the cross ratio in this way as a function, it's a Mobius transformation. So that tells us that, well, it's a bijection from the extended complex plane to itself. Another thing is, well, it has an inverse then. And I know that the inverse of a Mobius transformation is, again, a Mobius transformation. And uh, one more thing that we can recall, it's not implied by what we just did, but we know that the composition of Mobius transformations just gives you back another Mobius transformation. And if you take two and three, that inverses exist and that compositions still give you back a Mobius transformation, that can kind of gets you on your way to try to see that the set of Mobius transformations on the extended complex numbers forms a group. And that's one of those cool like overlaps between two seemingly really different areas of mathematics like abstract algebra uh, and complex analysis. And if you're curious about like, well, how is that used in complex analysis? Then again, that's, that's good stuff for Wikipedia. So what are we going to do with the cross ratio viewed as a function? So the first thing we're going to use it for is to try to answer the following proposition, or try to prove the following proposition. So let's say you fix three distinct extended complex numbers, z1, z2, and z3. Then the Mobius transformation defined by the cross ratio of these, that is going to be the unique Mobius transformation such that f takes z1 to 0, f takes z2 to 1, and f takes z3 to infinity. In other words, there is no other Mobius transformation that sends z1 to 0, z2 to 1, and z3 to infinity. Now let's prove this. So you should check that those values there, f of z1 is 0, f of z2 is 1, f of z3 is infinity. Those are true. Just plug them in and remember how algebra works in the extended complex plane. And what we're going to focus on is the uniqueness. And so how does a typical uniqueness proof go? Well, let's suppose that you had a function g that did the same thing. So g sends z1 to 0, and g tends z sends z2 to 1, and g sends z3 to infinity. And it's another Mobius transformation in particular. What we're going to look at, a little trick here, is let's look at the composition f composed with g inverse. And now, uh, what have we got? The composition of Mobius transformations is, again, a Mobius transformation. So I know that it has the form az plus b over cz plus d. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull on that a little bit. And uh, here, A, B, C, and D are just some ordinary complex numbers. So here's what we're going to do. We see, what if you plug in 0 into this composition? Well, I know that uh, since you know f takes z1 to 0, then f inverse takes 0 back to z1. And g takes z1 to 0. So g composed with f inverse just takes 0 to itself. Similarly, g composed with f inverse, uh, ooh, that should be, oh, no. Another way to see this, though, is uh, I've got a formula for g composed with f inverse. You just plug 0 in where the a, b, c's, and d's are. So plug 0 in for that z. It should work out to just b over d. So these are two expressions for the same, same quantity, right? Both of these things need to be g composed with f inverse of 0. So that tells me 0 has to be b over d. And uh, since b and d, you know, they're regular old complex numbers, the only way that can happen is if b is equal to 0. All right, so let's look, at, uh, let's look at what the composition does to infinity next. So I know that you know, f of z3 was infinity, so that means f inverse of infinity takes me back to z3. And I know g takes z3 to infinity. So in other words, g composed with f inverse takes infinity to itself. And what we're going to do is now let's look at the same thing. What does g composed with f inverse due to infinity look like when you plug infinity into the formula that I have above? Well, that looks like just a over c. 
So uh, again, you're kind of thinking about that from like, how do you get a horizontal asymptote for like some rational function, right? You just have the coefficients out front left over, the A over C. So again, well, these two things represent the same thing. So infinity has to be the same thing as A over C. And now at the extended complex plane, how can that happen? That means that the denominator C had to be zero. So, so far, I know I'm trying to kind of chip away at this formula AZ plus B over CZ plus D. And so far, I've worked it out so that I know that B is zero and C is zero. Now, the last thing that we'll do is we'll look at what is G composed with F inverse due to one. I know that that should just be G of Z2. And I know that that should just be one. And then again, from uh, playing with the formula, I can just plug one in for Z. And I see that I get a plus zero over zero plus D, where I'm using B is zero and C is zero that we've uncovered above. And uh, the point here is that one has to be the same thing as A over D, so that A has to be the same thing as D. And now what we'll do is let's look at our formula for the composition G composed with F inverse. I know it was AZ plus B over CZ plus D, but when I substitute all that good stuff that I know, such that B and C are zero and A and D are the same, so I'll just put an A down there instead, those cancel and I just get Z. So what does that say? That says that G composed with F inverse of Z just gives you back Z for all inputs Z in the extended complex plane. So in other words, like G composed with F inverse is you know, the identity function, it takes Z to Z. And so for the identity function, I'm just gonna use ID as the symbol for that. And uh, finally, again, thinking about this from like an abstract algebra perspective, if I compose both sides with F, I get that G has to be the same thing as F. So therefore, you know, this other Mobius transformation that did the same thing F did, oh, it turns out that that was just F. So F is the only such Mobius transformation, again, that takes Z1 to zero, Z2 to one, and Z3 to infinity. So why is that useful for us? Well, it turns out that that helps us answer our big question. So here's our theorem that we're gonna prove. Given three distinct extended complex numbers, Z1 through Z3, and another three distinct complex numbers, W1 through W3, and again, there can be some overlap between the Zs and the Ws, but just none of the Zs can match, and none of the Ws can match each other. Then there is only one Mobius transformation, F, such that F takes Z1 to W1, F takes Z2 to W2, and F takes Z3 to W3. And a little note about this. That tells me that the answer to my question above, like how many extended complex numbers determine a Mobius transformation? The answer is three. So here's our proof. Let's let G be the cross ratio of Z with Z, the other Zs, and let's let H be the cross ratio of the input Z with the other Ws there. So these two things are Mobius transformations. And by the previous proposition, I know that uh, these cross ratios uniquely satisfy uh, the following, G is the only one that takes Z1 to zero, Z2 to one, and Z3 to infinity. And H is the only one that takes W1 to zero, W2 to one, and W3 to infinity. And what we're going to do is we're gonna play again with the composition. Let's let F be the composition of H inverse with G. Now, as before, I know that the composition of two Mobius transformations is again a Mobius transformation. And if I just think about what does F do to Z1, well, that would be, um, you plug Z1 into G first, but that just gives you zero, and H takes zero back to W1. So you get F of Z1 is W1. Similarly, F of Z2 works out to be W2, and F of Z3 works out to be W3. So that's great. We've found a Mobius transformation F that does the thing we want it to do in the theorem. So it remains to show that F is the only Mobius transformation that in fact satisfies these three input-output relationships that we see. So now we need to show that F is unique. As before, let's say you've got another one that does it. So let's say a K is another Mobius transformation that uh, also takes Z1 to W1, Z2 to W2, and Z3 to W3. Again, we're gonna look at some kind of an in, uh, composition. Let's look at the composition of F inverse with K. And now F inverse of K, we notice satisfies F inverse of K of Z1. If you think about what does that do, that just gives you back Z1. F inverse of K of Z2, that should give you back Z2. And F inverse of K of Z3, that should give you back Z3. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply G to all sides of these three, to both sides of these three equations. So well, the first one looks like this, but now on the right, I can work that out a little bit more. Like I know what G does to Z1, G takes that to zero. Uh, for the second equation from the top, I know what G does to Z2, that takes it to one. And from the third equation from the top, 
I know what G does is E3, and it takes it to infinity. So what do we have then? If you look at these, this says that the function on the left, you know, G composed with F inverse composed with K, that does the same thing as G does to Z1, Z2, and Z3. But G was the unique function that spit out 0, 1, and infinity when you plugged in Z1, Z2, and Z3. So by uniqueness of G, I have to have that the function on the left, you know, that big composition, it has to just be the same thing as G. Right? G is the only function that has that relationship with Z1, Z2, Z3, 0, 1, and infinity. Now again, kind of an abstract algebra idea to finish this proof. What can I do? Why don't I compose both sides with G inverse? So that'll cancel it out. And then now, why don't I compose both sides with F? And I get that K had to be the function F. In other words, F is the only such function that takes C1 to W1, C2 to W2, and Z3 to W3.